Welcome to church fam, it's a great day to be in church whether you're here in the room or you're watching online just want to welcome you and say you are here for a reason and I'm Trisha if we haven't met yet and I'm part of the team here at Favor and we're about to continue to worship in just a bit but before that every Sunday we make space at this time to open up this space here in front over on the blue sides for prayer we are a church who believes in the power of prayer amen amen and prayer isn't just a thing that we do it's something that we just go to just say oh god these are the list of things that i need but prayer is actually a way for us to commune with god for us to connect with god and i don't know about you i i was reading about um the story of martha and mary earlier this this day and it was about Martha who was preparing for Jesus to come into her house but then she was so just so caught up in the things that she had to do she was preparing dinner she was preparing the table and all of that but there was one thing that stood out she was so busy preparing for the things for Jesus that she actually missed out on the presence of Jesus to actually miss being in his presence and connecting with him and i don't know about you but i don't know what you're carrying today or how you came into this room but you may be thinking of all the things that you have to be thinking about all the responsibilities that you have in your life your finances your relationships your family your work the things that you have to do this week the things that you have to do next week and these are all things that we have to carry on a daily basis but here in this place it's it's an there's an invitation for us to actually come into the presence of God and to lay down all of our burdens at his feet because he cares for us because he is our keeper and he is the source of our help and so if that's you if you're carrying anything this week as little as a uh, something I'm worrying about for tomorrow or as big as I need physical healing or I need a breakthrough in my finances can I invite you to start making your way forward and laying that burden at the feet of Jesus because at the feet at his presence everything changes he turns things around for us where they used to be worry there is peace that would come his peace would come when there used to be just a lack that that feeling of lack or poverty mentality he exchanges it with abundance where there is a is a um, feeling of like I don't know helplessness he comes in and brings in hope and the hope that he carries is a hope that will not fail us so if that's you if you have a need if you have if you're believing for for financial breakthrough if you're believing for restoration in your relationships if you're believing for physical health physical healing we actually want to come and invite you to this side and we will anoint you with oil as it says in James and believe in supernatural healing for you so if that's you why don't you start making your way forward over to the sides on the blue lights and over at the middle and if you're waiting for someone to pray for you you can just continue to worship but for the rest of us if you're carrying anything in this room why don't you lift your hands as we fix our eyes on Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord that you care about us thank you Lord that you are our keeper God that our help comes from you God and we can rely on you you are faithful Lord and so we fix our eyes on you and we say we trust you and we say that we let go of all of these things because we say that you are faithful we believe in who you say you are God and we believe that you are a strong tower you give comfort to those who are mourning God you give breakthrough and hope to those who are feeling helpless and so we praise you and we glorify you we honor you in this place as we say amen 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 so if that's you can start making your way forward and for the rest of us let's continue to worship
you again Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through No mountain you can't move on Things are possible
sing it one more time. There is a name that defies the grave. My flesh may fail, still my hope remains. And when it's time to enter heaven's gate, I'll finally hear the Savior call my name.
chapter 6. And this is one of the famous verses about Jesus being rejected rejected even in his hometown. Is it not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and the Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. And listen to this. And he could not do any mighty work there except that he had laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. I don't know about you, but I want to see cancer disappear in this place. I don't know about you, but I want to see people getting raised from the dead. I don't know about you, but I want to see revival happening in this nation. I don't know about you, but I want to awaken this city. I want to see this place being so sold out to Jesus. But that could not happen if even in our hearts we are rejecting God. Yes, we know of Him. We know of Him. We know Him since we were young. But it says here, He could not do any mighty work there because of unbelief. But in this house, who believe here that we love Jesus? Who here believes that we honor Jesus in this place? That He is welcome in this place? So this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to honor Him. We're going to welcome His presence in this place. And we're going to love Him. Come on, can you lift up your hands to heaven right now? Come on, if there's unbelief in your heart, I pray right now, God, let there be an unmo- a movable faith to rise up in this room, God. Let there be faith there, God. Let unbelief be gone in our hearts, in our minds, God. And we honor you. We love you. We welcome you. We're going to sing you. We're worthy. You are worthy. I don't know what you've gone through this week. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what wall you are in front right now. But I believe that Jesus is the only way that He can make anything impossible possible. Thank you, Jesus. God, we pray right now. If there are a few people here who are still struggling to believe you, God, there are people here who's going through cancer, who's going through any disease that some doctors would say there's no cure. God, we speak the name of Jesus in that area. If you're in a debt right now, that you feel like it's a hopeless, endless situation, God, we speak Jesus in that area of their lives. I want to speak, pray specifically for all the parents. If you're a parent, can you raise your hand right now, wherever you are? God, I pray for every parent right now, God. Come on, if you are seated or standing beside a parent, come on, can you lay your hands on them? God, we thank you that you have called them to be parents, God. That you have entrusted them with a kid, with a children, Lord God. I pray right now, God, that you would strengthen them right now, God. That in moments of overwhelming situation, God, that they can speak your name. That there's no fear attached, Lord God, in parenthood, in Jesus' name. 
and that they would never forget, Lord God, that they are still a son and a daughter in their fatherhood. You love them, you love them, you love them, and I speak peace over them. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray, always say, Amen and Amen. Awesome. Give me now, take your seats. Come on, give a high five to the person next to you and say, Speak Jesus. We're going to continue our worship through our giving and we believe in a church that we give out of a conviction, not compulsion. And before you give, there's so many different ways how to give. You can go to give.favor.church for all the different ways you can go. Uh, there's BDO, Union Bank, Gcash, Maya. If you still have crypto, you can still also send in crypto. And if, um, if you want to give in cash, there's an envelope right in front of you. And please don't leave that there if you've, um, you're giving in cash. But you can bring those um, cards outside. We have a steel giving box outside and you can drop them off right there. So if you've give, given or about to give, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much, God, that you have entrusted us with these finances. No matter how big, how small this is, God, we thank you that we are able to give what's already yours, God. So I thank you right now, God, that you would use our finances, Lord God, to expand your kingdom in this earth, God. We thank you that we would see marriages restored, God. That we would see family being restored, Lord God. And we would see a revival happening in this nation, Lord God, because of what you're doing, Lord God. So I pray, bless this, God, this tithes and offering that we have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Happy Sunday, everybody. Wow, parang walang energy, ah. Happy Sunday, everybody. If you're watching online, if you haven't met yet, my name is Albi and I'm part of team here at Favor Church. And you know what? Yesterday, we just had our first ever, I think it's annually, first ever Favor Fun Day. So here was uh, Favor Fun Day yesterday. So it was a day where we uh, had parlor games, we played different games, and it was our social connect day and it was just awesome. Do you guys know, some of them, or most of them are not here yet because they have muscle sore, so they're probably gonna attend the 3 and the 5 p.m. service. And you know what? Here in the church, we really love people, so I'm gonna call on some of our beautiful friends from our VIP team. And this right in front of you is Tito Danny. He just turned 36 last week. Now in the 82. Just kidding. He's just in his 50s. But in their hands, they have this new people bag. And in those bags, they have information about the church. We have a chocolate inside those bags. And we want to give this bag to you just to say thank you for coming along for the very first time here in our church. And you can see in those bags how to get connected in our church. So if you're a first time, I invited one of my pickleball playmates here, Takahiro. He's from Japan. So he's awesome. So he's here. You don't need to stand. It's okay. But you know what? If that's you or if you brought someone new for the very first time, come on, can you stick up your hand right now? And we want to welcome you in three, two, one, let's go. For every time you know what to do. Come on, can we welcome all the people in this place? For every time I think we can do a little better than that. We're so grateful that you dropped by. You visited us. Thank you so much, guys. We love you. I think one more here. Awesome. We love you. And we can't wait to connect you here in our church. And one last time, can we welcome all the new people in the house? One more day. Oh, oh. New people in the houses. Up to the left, to the right slide. Oh, eh. Oh. Oh, that's enough. Well, you know what? After the service, we want to get to talk to you. We want to get to know you. We want to talk to you. But if you're rushing for your lunch or dinner, or I don't know, maybe breakfast, brunch, you can fill out one of these cards inside your bag. And one of our teams would call you or text you this week just to get to know you because we know that you have a story to tell and we want to hear about it. Amen. Amen. And you know what? Our church is a friendly church. So can, we get, can I ask everybody? I say everybody to get up on their feet and we're gonna do get to know. We're gonna take two minutes to get to know somebody and ask this question. Wow, walang tumayo. <laughs> and get to ask this question. What is your favorite hobby? Come on, I can see you from the back. You're not standing up. And we'll see you in two minutes. See you online.
love our church. So I hope you get to know somebody new today. And I asked one of our stage managers, what's her hobby? She said she just likes staying at home. Anyone who likes staying at home? Yeah, all the introvert people. I love you guys. I don't like staying at home. But Pastor James is going to come up in a little bit. Are you guys excited? But there's so many great things happening in the life of our church. So why don't you fix your eyes on this week's edition of... Of... Favorite News. Hey, Favor fam! Welcome to this week's edition of Favor News. For all the info and announcements that I'm about to mention, visit favor.church slash manila news. Let's go! Hey, Favor movement! If you're a young adult from 18 to 25 years old, we have a lot of exciting events coming up for our community. Breakfast Q&A with our senior pastor, Pastor James Aiden, is back. Join us on Zoom on April 12 at 8 a.m. Don't miss this chance to ask your burning questions about life direction, relationships, ministry, or anything under the sun. Calling all college undergrad students. Don't have plans yet for the April 9 holiday? Come to College Fun Day at any time between 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at our Shang Studio. We've got board games, video games, movie watch parties, and more fun stuff in store for you. This is all for college students, so invite your barcada, blockmates, and org mates. You don't want to miss this. Let us know if you're coming by RSVPing through this link right here. But wait! There's more! If you're a college student, come join us for dinner after at the Galleria Food Court after the 5.30pm service today. We have free ice cream for you! See you later! Welcome to the dark room. Where light and color are birthed out of complete darkness. It's a place in space where nothing suddenly becomes something. Amidst bustling streets, lost in a sea of faces, we navigate the chaos, searching for our places. We can all live life going through the motions, getting in line with being busy, surviving the rush, wishing for an encounter, waiting, but not quite sure for what. When, out of nothing, suddenly, something calls to our being. Starts changing. It won't be obvious at first. Just a glimmer, a spark. Then the light starts flooding everywhere, every part, marked for a purpose, shining through the surface, invading our atmosphere, invading our heart. What causes a supernova? The biggest explosions of light we've ever seen? The death of a star. To all our businessmen and women, we're having a special business breakfast happening during the Favor Conference. It's going to be a great time to connect with other business leaders in our church, and we'll also get to hear a word from Pastor Phil Pringle. It's happening on May 11, 8 a.m. at the Marco Polo, right across our conference venue. Tickets are priced at 2,000 pesos per head, which includes a buffet breakfast. Take note that this is only open to Favor Conference attendees, so make sure you buy your tickets for the conference before booking your business breakfast ticket. If you want to fully experience the freedom you have in Christ and break free from anything that's holding you back, join Freedom Encounter. It'll be a full morning of intensive teaching and prayer ministry time happening on Saturday, April 13 at our Favor Shang Studio. If you're interested and can commit to attending, don't forget to register. This is going to be totally free. Here at Favor, we love celebrating milestones because we're one big family. A big congratulations to the 81 individuals who publicly declared their faith in Jesus by getting baptized last Sunday. And also to Patrick and Ellen for their new baby, Emmanuel. Welcome to the world, baby Emmanuel! 
and to Peng and Anna Dalai for celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, fam! We love you! There are so many things happening in the life of our church. All the links you need from today's announcements are on favor.church slash manila news or you could drop by our info booth at the foyer after our service to ask questions, share a testimony, or even volunteer for a team. Stay updated by visiting our website or by following our social media channels popping up on your screen right now. And that is it for Favor News. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome today. Uh, if we've never met, my name's James, and I'm going to preach in just a moment. Before I do, uh, I just want us to pray uh, for a moment. Uh, this week uh, in the Philippines, a great man of God went to be with Jesus. Uh, his name is Pastor Ferdy, uh, Bishop, Pastor, however you know him, uh, Pastor Ferdy Kabiling uh, from Victory Church. And he's been with the church ever since the beginning. Uh, for the last 40 years, has preached the gospel of Jesus. He ran from the top of the country down to the bottom of the country to raise money and then back up again and every twice, I don't know. He did every, incredible things. I got, had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, and when I did, he was so lovely, he was so caring and kind, and I know he had an impact on many different people in our church, but he definitely had an impact in our nation, and it was a, it was a sudden loss, and so we love, we love Victory Church. So many good things in this country have come from Victory Church, so we just want to take a moment to pray for his family and the church, because it, it's a big loss. It, it's an unexpected loss, and it's a big loss. And so we want to pray for our brothers and sisters. Can we do that? Come on, let's just pray. Lord, we really love you. And God, even though we don't have all the answers and we don't understand why things happen sometimes, Lord, I thank you that Pastor Ferdy is with you right now. The very Jesus that he so passionately preached and followed for 40 years now, he is in heaven with you. And we thank you for that. God, for those that have been left behind, his wife, his kids, God, his family, those that are close to him, we pray that the peace from heaven that we don't fully understand would come and it would descend on their family, it would guard their hearts and guard their minds right now. Lord, we pray for victory. We thank you for just what a, an amazing church of God they are, the impact they've had in this nation. And God, we pray that as a church, as they mourn this week and in this season for such an integral part of their church, we pray that you would be with them, bring comfort to them. You are the comforter, Holy Spirit. So we pray, come and bring comfort to the leadership, Lord God. Bring comfort to those that are within the church. We thank you that that church would continue, God, to grow from strength to strength. Lord God, that they would continue to have an amazing impact in this nation. So, Lord, everyone involved, God, we just pray that your peace would come. Lord, I thank you for a life well lived, a life that was lived to bring you glory. So many wonderful people affected and changed by the life of Pastor Ferdy. So, God, we give you glory for his life. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be with those of us left behind. Give your peace, give your peace, give your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 You know, it, it's always sad when you lose one of God's generals, but it's pretty amazing that he gets to be with Jesus now, right? And so we celebrate his life and we pray for those here. And just what, a, what an amazing life lived and the impact that he had on so many. I know he's had an impact even people within our church and even on our staff. And so... Uh, we just want to honor his family and honor his life as we pray for them. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to church today. Welcome for everyone watching online. I got a lot of weird looks as people came in uh, because of this thing that is on my nose. And I just want to give a quick explanation. I was walking in the mall a couple of days ago and a man came up to my wife and said some inappropriate things. And so I got in a fight and I punched him out. And no, I'm, j I'm joking. I went to the doctor on Friday and I have, because I have, I'm white, 
because I'm white, we burn easily. Come on. Any other white people here? We burn. Thank you. The Filipinos, you just go darker. Us white people, we go redder, right? We burn. And so because I've been in the sun my whole life, I had a sunspot on my nose. And the doctor said, we needed to cut it out. Uh, and we caught it in time. It was going to be I said, what, what is it? She said, some big long name. I don't know what it is. I said, is that cancer? She goes, no, no, it's pre-cancer. I went, pre-cancer? So not cancer yet. She goes, no, no, not cancer yet. But if you left it, it would become cancer. So it's pre-cancer. Uh, and so uh, we cut out the pre-cancer. And so we had a 10-minute uh, discussion before service. Should I have a Band-Aid on or should I leave it off? And even now, as I look at the audience, so many of you are looking up at my face right there. <laughs> I can see some of you like this. Ready? This, honestly, I'm not going to name names, but you're like this. So I need you to focus on the word of God today and not my nose, okay? Focus on the word of God, not my nose. But I do have a big nose anyway, that doesn't help. It's great to have the Shaw family who have moved from England this week to be here with us. They're, they've moved here. Mick's going to be doing Bible college. So we got English and he just became a Filipino citizen as well. So congratulations. Uh, you know, it was my idea, but whatever, that's fine. <laughs> Wish I could become a Filipino citizen that easily, but apparently we hate foreigners in the Philippines, so <laughs> that won't be happening anytime soon. So uh, great to have you guys here. Love you, part of the family, and uh, it's just wonderful to be in church. I want to preach a sermon today that I have been percolating on for many, many years and if you've been in my sphere of leadership, be it in leaders meetings or Q&As that I do with our young people, all that kind of stuff, you would have heard me speak on concepts that I'm going to pull out today from God's word, but I've never actually preached a sermon on it before. It's the first time that I'm actually preaching a whole sermon on it. And so I pray that the Lord would use this, that I would say this in the correct tone, uh, and that uh, it would go to hearts of people today. I think one of the most quoted, or <laughs> maybe I should say misquoted Bible verses in the whole Bible from people who don't go to church, right? Like people that don't know the Bible seem to know this one verse in the Bible. And it's also used by people that attend church but don't want any accountability. And they say, well, the Bible says don't judge. Yeah, see, you're all giggling, right? Don't judge me, right? So that's what they say. You'd be amazed how many non-church attendees know that verse in the Bible. Well, the Bible says, don't judge me. You're being judgmental. And obviously where they're pulling it from is Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. And it's always very easy to take one little verse out of the Bible, to cherry pick it, to misquote it, to be able to use it as your defense completely out of context. And so we use this and we go, well, don't judge. And this means that, well, should we all just shut our mouths then? If uh, we're not allowed to judge anyone, then how can anyone be held accountable? You know, the very safety of our society is based on people in certain positions, like the police, like judges, that have the ability to judge people. But they must judge according to something. In our court system in the Philippines, God bless the transparency of it, in our court system in the Philippines, you can only legally, technically be judged by the law. The crowd of people that use this don't judge me, I call them the don't judge me crowd. A lot of times, particularly those that attend church, well, you can't judge me. Don't judge me. What they do is they create their own God. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. They create their own God, and it's a God who loves so much that how could he ever judge? And so what they end up doing is creating a God of love but a God without judgment. And if God doesn't judge, well then what right does that give anyone else to judge? Well, today I wanna to preach from two main texts in the Bible, and I wanna hopefully dispel 
these untruths. The title of my sermon today is this, How to Judge Without Being Judgmental. Some of y'all have been waiting for this sermon. I told you, huh? Here we go. Matthew 7, I'm going to read two scriptures and we're going to go through it. Let's start with Matthew 7 first. Verse 1, this is Jesus speaking. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I want to jump to 1 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Christians in Corinth. This is what he says in chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or a sister in Christ, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside expel the wicked person from among you. So here's the headline, ready? Jesus says, don't judge or you'll be judged. Paul says, don't judge people outside the church, but if they're inside the church, go for it. Some people think that these two contradict each other, but today I want to unpack these scriptures because I, I think that with the context, it's really clear that they actually support one another. So let's start with Paul first, writing to this church in Corinth. And we got to get context. And maybe you need to read 1 Corinthians, uh, the whole book, particularly chapter 5, to really gain a true, true understanding of all of this. But Paul's already written a letter to them. We don't have that letter. It's like pre-1 Corinthians. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the what's it called before? The, it's the pre Star Wars prequel you know Star Wars before yeah so he wrote a prequel that we don't have access to and in that he wrote you know don't hang out with sexually immoral people but the Christians in Corinth they mistook that they took it the wrong way and basically they started saying well we can't spend time with anybody that is sexually immoral or drunkard or any of these things and Paul's like that's impossible you can't do that you can't, you're not going to be able to do any business. You're not going to be able to buy any groceries. You're not going to be able to catch any jeepneys. You're not going to be able to do anything. You can't avoid sinful people in this world. He says, huh, they're outside of church. They don't believe God. What right do I have? What business is it of mine to judge those outside of the church? Why? Because they live by different standards. You can't debate someone outside of the church and use the Bible as your source of authority because they don't care. But we're all going to be judged. Paul's saying just leave it up to God. Romans 2 verse 5, Paul writes this, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant, that's a key word in his sermon today, unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Heads up, everyone. God is going to judge. And when people say, you can't judge me, only God can judge me. I say, ha ha, you're correct. But I don't think that means what you think it means. I'd much rather be judged by a person than God. Why? Because the consequences are different. 2 Corinthians 5.10, in the same book, Paul writes, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Sorry, the other book of Corinthians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We will be judged for the things that we are, again, the key word, unrepentant of. So let's go back to Paul. 
talking to the Corinthians, right? Here he, he corrects them. And he's holding them accountable for a current situation that is happening in the church. A man is having an open, adulterous relationship with his father's wife. And the church isn't doing anything about it. And Paul is coming in hard saying, hey, if someone's in church claiming to follow Christ but is living in an open lifestyle of unrepentant sin, you know what Paul says? You got to confront it, and if they don't repent, you got to kick them out. In fact, he's actually quoting an Old Testament scripture here when he says, expel the wicked person among you. So outside the church, ah, don't worry about it. Let God deal with them. But inside the church, you claim to be a brother, a sister in Christ, then we must deal with it. And if they are unrepentant, then the Bible says, and this is where people begin to get a little bit uncomfortable, the Bible says, kick him out. This is where it gets awkward. This is one of those scriptures where people just want to avoid this in the Bible. We just want to, just go back to John three sixteen. God loves everyone. Just do that with this. Isn't that nice? God loves everyone. The reason why we start getting uncomfortable about this in the modern day church is because unfortunately churches that have gone before us and even maybe some churches now have maybe taken this scripture and abused it. There are maybe people here or people watching or listening that have come from very legalistic churches where they really lived by these verses, as in, it's like the cross of Jesus, then it's kick out the unrepentant person from your church. And unfortunately, and I want to say an apology on behalf of many pastors, unfortunately, we have gotten it wrong as the big C church many times. We've disciplined people and remove them from leadership positions for an allocated amount of time because that's what you're supposed to do. You made a mistake, you gotta spend six months on the sidelines, and so we push them aside, we discipline them, but we never ever get to the core root of the brokenness that led to the sin in the first place. And we don't end up ministering and loving people, we just discipline them. And there are some people who have actually been on a journey and we've disciplined them in church like they've already reached the destination. What, what does that mean? Let me explain that. There are many things in a Christian walk that run counterculture to the way that the world operates. And Satan is the counterfeit of Jesus. And so it would make sense that everything that comes from Satan is actually a counterfeit. Counterfeit looks real, but eventually it will break, right? So there are people that come into a church community. And this is what happens. If you come from the world, living under the rule of Satan, now you may not even realize that's what's happening. You're not sitting there worshiping Satan. But if you live in the world outside of Jesus, then you're under the rule of the prince of this world. World, which is Satan, the prince of darkness. And so when people come into church or come into a relationship with Jesus, they go through a process of detoxing all the worldly counterfeit things that they have lived in and believed as truth. And once they find Jesus, they enter this journey we call the sanctification journey, which is simply us becoming more like Jesus. The things of the world that once controlled us, losing its control, and us becoming controlled and under the power, the authority, the rule, and reign of Jesus Christ. The old way of thinking and living is changing, and the new way of thinking, I'm now a new creation, is coming in, and I'm beginning to live in a way that reflects the Jesus way and how the Bible tells us to live. Now, some people will still struggle with sins and biblical concepts as they are on this journey. Let me give you an example. Let's talk about sexual identity and sexual preferences. So people will live in the world and go, well, this is what I believe. This is who I believe I am. And then they have an encounter with Jesus. They read the Bible and all of a sudden, the Bible says, no, that's not who you are. This is who you are. And so begins the wrestle. And it's a wonderful wrestle. 
And it's a great wrestle. And it's a wrestle that people have where they go, oh, but this is who I always thought I was. This is what I always believed. But now I'm seeing that the Bible tells me that the truth is actually this. Oh, how do I feel about this? And people then go on a journey. And can I tell you, I love the journey. Our church is here for the journey. I love people wrestling with God. Why? Because it means they're really getting down to the core of, I might have to change who I thought I always was. And for some people, that might be an easy decision, but for other people, that's a wrestle, and I'm okay with it. And guess what? Our church loves that, and we walk the journey with people that are on this journey. But when someone has reached a destination, that means this, they have decided that they will hold a certain belief. Whether it's now in line, oh, this is what I once thought, but now this is what the Bible says, so I'm in line with this, or this is what I once thought, this is what the Bible says, or what your church is teaching, but I don't think you're right. So I'm just going to hold to my belief of what I think is right, but I'm going to come into church because I want to receive all the benefits of the church community, yet still hold on to what I think and I believe. So the problem is this, is that in the past, a lot of churches would discipline or be awkward or not know how to handle people that were on the journey, and they would treat them like people that had already reached the destination. There was no space for the journey, and that's why a lot of churches in eras gone by got labeled judgmental, got labeled legalistic, not loving. They would hand out disciplines without ever actually talking with people and walking alongside people. And so here's what's happened. Because of judgmental, not loving, legalistic, what we've done in a lot of churches is, because we feel uncomfortable with that, and that is wrong, we've swung, but we've swung the other way maybe a little bit too far. And now we don't want to seem like a judgmental church, so we're just going to show everyone love. We're going to love everyone. We're going to love everyone. You're, you're, you're doing that? That's okay. God loves you, and so do we. And that sounds nice, but this is exactly what was happening in the church in Corinth. They weren't addressing the open sin that was going on and being flaunted in the church. That man wasn't on a journey. He knew the truth. He had reached his destination and he was living in sin. He wanted to live in sin but have the benefits of a godly community around him. And so do you know what was Paul's solution? Judge him and kick him out. I'm not putting words in the Bible here. This is what Paul said. You know, my relationship with people will reflect how I interact with them. So I'm a parent. I have kids. When I see another child throwing a tantrum, like a big tantrum, right? You know those, you know those, those tantrums that are just like, you, just, you never want to have a child when you see that tantrum? You know, when it's somebody else's child, you know, you know what I do? I just smile and thank God that's not my child in that moment. That's what I do, honestly, honestly. The behavior's terrible, but I'm not their parent. Not my responsibility, right? I don't. Now, if one of my children have those tantrums, which many of you have seen them have those tantrums before, when my kid does that, oh boy, I am all over them like white on rice, right? Why? Because... It's not the behavior alone that sparked my response. It was the relationship that I had with the person displaying the behavior. Biblical judgment must always be motivated by love and aim towards repentance and reconciliation. If the goal is to embarrass and to exclude, then we have the wrong motivation. Paul's advice here is shaping us and how we treat one another inside of the church rather than outside. Paul even writes in a separate letter in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. 
This is the heart of our church. The heart of our church is always to restore, and the motivation of our church is love. And so how we do that affects the tone in which we do it. And our tone must always be gentle, but be firm. Gentle, but firm. People want the gentle, but sometimes they react against the firm. You know, even within our church, we've actually gone through the process in, in the eight years that, that we've, you know, been here, seven and a half, eight years that we've been alive. We, we have three people that we've actually gone through the process of getting to a point where we've said, you know what, you are no longer welcomed in this community. That might shock some of you because you've never really heard about it before. But two of those people ended up getting arrested after this, so we did the right thing. It, we definitely, they got arrested and, and we made very strong statements within the leadership of our church about it. And then another one was just wildly inappropriate with females and making people feel uncomfortable in our church. And so after significant, many multiple warnings and warnings and warnings and warnings, we then had to say, you know what? Your behavior in our church is making people feel uncomfortable. Uh, this is not the community for you. So we had to say goodbye to three people. There's been other people in our church community that we have held accountable for sinful behavior, but instead of seeking repentance and healing, they have left our church and gone somewhere else. In modern day church, this is actually what usually happens. If someone is unrepentant, then why would they actually stay in the church and go through a program of healing and repentance? If they are unrepentant and they realize that, well, the, the church or the leadership is not going to change their standard on this or they're not going to back down, well, then we'll just leave and we'll just go to another church down the road. And you know, this happens every single week in most churches around the world. Worse, some of them go and actually start their own church somewhere else. But see, in Paul's time, it was a little bit different because when Paul was writing to the Christians in Corinth, there was only one church in Corinth. There wasn't multiple churches. There wasn't 11 churches in the one building like there is right here in Galleria. And so church discipline felt far more drastic in Paul's time, and it probably didn't happen as much because people would either repent and stay or they would walk away from the faith completely. Nowadays, the epidemic that has hit the church is we have a bunch of people that avoid repentance and restoration and they just walk down the road to another church. I love having different flavors of different churches. We celebrate all the different flavors of all the different churches that help reach all the different flavors of all the different people in our world. But here's the downside of it. It's made it easy for people to run away from being challenged and being held accountable in a church community. So I want to say something that's very strong, and I want to say this to every person that calls themselves a member of favorite church. So listen. Listen to me. If you have done this and you have come to our church from another church because you wanted to avoid repenting, you wanted to avoid accountability in that other church, if you call yourself a member of our church, this is my challenge to you. I want you to go back to your old pastor. I want you to go back to your old church and I want you to repent. And I want you to listen to anything they say because you don't know maybe how much you hurt that pastor or hurt that leader. You don't, I'm not telling you to go back to that church, but what I want to be very strong with today is that if there is anything left unsaid, if there is any unrepentance there in your heart, I want to challenge you. Why? Because you will never be able to fully engage here while you're still carrying baggage from there. And it will only be a matter of time until someone offends you here or someone holds you accountable here. And because you haven't learned the process of how to deal with that, you will just walk away from this church and go to another church down the road. This has happened multiple in the last two months this has happened multiple times even to people in our staff in a really beautiful way we've had people i had someone write me a couple months ago actually I have multiple people have written me in the last couple of months apologizing and repenting to me 
about things that they were a part of, things that they had said, things that they had listened to, lies that they had believed about me. Uh, one person who goes to another church now, and I love the church that that person goes to, and I think the person should stay in that church because they're growing, wrote me and repented and used the words, I repent for my sin of being a part of backstabbing and being a part of lies. Please forgive me. Now, I wasn't waiting for that message. But I'll be honest with you, it blessed my heart. But you know, even more than that, I think it would have blessed their heart. Because now we're good. I see them, I give them a big hug. Why? Because there's nothing there. They repented. Man, if God's forgiven them, so will I. And they're living now in a great church and they're growing and they're becoming a great person in God. So Paul's clear. If it's inside the church, you can judge. How many of y'all feel a little bit nervous about that? <laughs> no, for real, right? Like this, oh, you can't judge me. Uh-uh. If you're in the church, if you're a brother or sister, welcome. Do you know, that's why we're called the family. We're the family of God. How many of y'all get judged by your parents or your siblings? Come on, put up your hand. Right? You, all the time. Wow, huh? Put on weight since last year, huh? Right? You get judged in your family. But, but why? Because they love you and they're not going to walk out on you. Yeah, on. Judgment that comes is not to be mean. It's to help bring people into alignment of what the Bible is calling us to live like. Sometimes it's hard to judge someone's heart. But can I tell you, it's always easy to judge someone's fruit. Some people are like, well, you don't know my heart. God knows my heart. Correct. God does. And you're correct. Sometimes it's hard to judge your heart. But it's very, very easy to see the fruit. Very easy. The fruit is either good or it's not good. It's very easy. Matthew 7 and 15, same chapter. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Wow. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Fruit will always grow. Sometimes, though, it takes time. And sometimes you can some people say, how come you didn't know about that person in church? They're so, how come you didn't know? Where's your discernment? Well, we have discernment, but sometimes it takes time for a tree to grow. Sometimes it takes time for the fruit to really come. You know what I found? That time is always the great revealer. Fake, I preached a message on this, fake will always eventually break. Sin will always be exposed. If brokenness is not dealt with, it will continue to come up time and time again. I've seen many different people start things get offended with church or church isn't doing this or church isn't this way and so they go and they start their own thing. And when you look at it, it doesn't have great godly leadership. You know, within our church, I, I'm not just the pastor that gets to bang, 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 do anything I want. Within our church, we have a financial board that sets the limits financially of what we can do and oversee. We've got a apostolic covering over our church that keeps Kate and I accountable in everything that we do. Plus, I'm actually just accountable to my staff and my team and to you guys, the church. We're, we try and be very accountable. And I've seen people start things and there's no godly accountability there's no godly you know leadership in there and they just want to do their own thing people ask me well should I go to this group should I do, be a part of this thing and and I always say listen I'm not a controlling manipulative leader you can do whatever you want you do whatever you want right at the end of the day it doesn't matter what I say you're going to do whatever you want to do but you'll be the one that will experience the consequence for whatever choice that you make. And I always say, you know what? I don't know if I feel comfortable with that group. And people have asked, well, what's your thoughts? And I always say this, just give it time. Because time will reveal whether or not this group or whatever this is is godly. And I promise you, more times than not, 
time reveals. Fights happen, people break up, and this and that, and all this. They end up in sin. People leading it end up being in big sin, all this kind of stuff. Why? Because they actually don't have any godly accountability. They've removed themselves from godly accountability. All you got to do is give it time, and the fruit will tell its story. I want to encourage you. Seek people in church that can be honest with you that you can allow them to speak into your life, to hold you accountable. James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The goal of confessing sin is not to be punished, it's to be healed. Allow people close enough in your world to call you out on your sin and openly chase it. I want to be the healthiest version of me. But do you know the healthiest version of me is someone that is open to correction and being called out for sin? It is. It's the healthiest version of me. The healthiest father I can be is someone that's open to being called out if I father wrong. The healthiest husband I can be is someone that's open to being called out if I'm being a husband that's in a, in a manner not befitting my wife. The healthiest leader I can be is someone that calls me out. Be open to being called out. I'm telling you, if you allow yourself to be open to being called out, you will just have a better life. A few years ago, I've told this story. It's not a big deal, but I was filming something one time, and we had a couple people in the room, and I started making jokes. I make jokes all the time. I'm a very funny person, and it's a blessing, but it's also a curse, because sometimes I say the wrong thing at the wrong time. So I made a joke. I was making jokes. It wasn't too harmful, but I was making jokes, making jokes, of, and having, having fun and laughing with this one person. And, uh, and so uh, later that night, uh, this person called me. And I could feel the nervousness in their voice. Hi, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor James. Like, yeah. yeah. Hi, um, listen, I, I just want to call you. I just want to say that earlier on today when you made those jokes, this is how it made me feel. Oh, if you could have shot an arrow through my heart in that one moment, I, it just, it broke me. And, and, I, and I allowed them to speak. And at the end of it, I, after they got out what they wanted to say, my, you know what my response was? How dare you call your senior pastor? Who do you think you are? I am the man of God. Now, do you know, you know what my response was? I, I almost, I had to hold back tears. I had to hold back tears. And I said, how dare, no, I didn't. I, you know what I said? Oh, it's a joke. Uh, it's a joke. You know what I said? I said, I am so sorry. I did not intend for that joke to, to be that way. I'm so sorry. Now, as I hear it back, I can hear that it wasn't building, it wasn't uplifting, and I really apologize. And they said, and, and so I had this moment of vulnerable humility where I went, okay, I come under, and, I, and I'm going to do that. And I said, oh, thank you. And then I clicked back into being their pastor, and I said, can I just say, I want to honor you for having the guts to call me up. And listen, this isn't a random person, so if I don't know you, don't start calling me up. <laughs> you said this to me, and you said that, like, if you're watching online, I don't know you, don't write me. Just write Rocky dot Javier. Rocky handles all, all that. But this person had a relationship with me. And, 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 and I said, I just want to honor you for having the guts to call me out, to, to showing me my, my blind side, to showing me my, my blind spots. Thank you for doing that for me. And you know what? From that day on, that happened maybe, I think maybe four years ago. That is always in the front of my mind, that story, whenever I'm with groups of people making jokes. And listen, sometimes I maybe still say something that's not great, so give me grace. But, but God dealt with me in my heart. He judged me. That person judged me for saying the wrong thing. Well, you can't judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing me how ugly I looked in the mirror. I want to be a better person, so thank you for showing me 
my ugliness. I want to be the healthiest version of me. But how we do this can either build someone up or tear them down. We can either lead people to healing or we can create a deeper brokenness in them. So now we're going to go all the way back to our favorite, most misquoted verse in the Bible. And this time, though, we're going to read it in context because in it, it teaches us how to judge without being judgmental. Let's go back, Matthew 7. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, so let's now, and I, and I think you would even read this a little bit differently now after I've preached this whole sermon to this point, there's some obvious things that we can pull out of here. So don't judge unless you're prepared to be judged. But I kind of just preached, everyone, be prepared to be judged. We should all be ready to be judged. So if we're all ready to be judged, then guess what? We can now judge. Now that we've openly established being chased, chasing judgment, This opens the door for us. And when combine it with Paul's teaching on who we need to judge. And just like criminals that are judged according to the law, we judge not according to the Old Testament law, but we judge according to the New Testament grace. This is how we should judge. Jesus is not telling us to avoid these tough conversations, but he's telling us to make sure that we aren't hypocrites, that we are doing some big soul searching and self analysis before we go pointing the finger at anybody else. Remember, every time you point the finger at someone else, there's three fingers being pointed back at you. It means that how we say it is done through the filter of having grace for others spec in their eye, understanding that we probably have a plank in our eye. So let's go back to the mistakes that some of our churches have made in decades gone by. We would hold other people accountable for things that we would never hold ourselves to. We would hand out discipline that ourselves would avoid. We would scold and get legalistic about things that were our opinion and not actually the word of God. All the while, hiding our own mess, hiding our own shortcomings, painting a picture that we're perfect pastors, it ruined people's lives. It was hypocrisy at its finest. And it's people that are quick to call out sin in others, but ignorant to their own sin and their own shortcomings. And Jesus turns it all around, and he says, you should remove the speck from your brother's eye. You should. This is judgment, but before you do it, look at yourself. You should. Man, if there's a speck in someone else's eye, don't just walk away. You should want to remove it, but before you walk into that, look at the plank in your own eye. And when you realize that you got a plank in your own eye, one of two things is going to happen. Either one, you're going to realize that you're not the right person to give that feedback. And maybe you should leave it to somebody else. Or number two, you'll understand our own weakness and the grace that I so freely seek and the way in which I share about their speck will be dripping in love and grace, being gentle and firm because I know I need that same grace. Welcome to how to judge without being judgmental. And that is the end of my sermon. John's yelling out, judge me. It's kind of weird, but okay, it's in line with the message. How to judge without being judgmental. Within our church, we want to love people and we want to help people be the best Christ followers that they can be. So we want to help you with love, with grace, with humility. But as well, we don't want to let open and unrepentant sin 
just dance and flaunt around our church. Why? Because sin is like a poison. Once it gets a hold of you, it'll get a hold of other people. That's why Paul said in Galatians, hey, restore people gently, but watch out that you don't get tempted with the same thing as well. You know, the ultimate judgment that's going to come one day is a judgment that God is going to give us for our sins. And our sins are everything that we've done that's outside the boundaries of how God would want us to live. And that sin actually separates us from God. And in order for us to have a relationship with God, we need to come before the cross that we all celebrated last week at Easter. And we need to acknowledge who Jesus is, that Jesus is the only way that we can get to God the Father. That by acknowledging our own sin, humbling ourselves and saying, God, we need you. I'm sorry for believing things. I'm sorry for doing life my own way. God, I I really need you in my life. Forgive me of our sins. Then he'll come and he'll wash us clean. One day we will all face judgment from God when we go from this life to the next. But Jesus took our judgment upon himself. The judgment for our sins, he took upon himself. And I'm so grateful because you and I, we're not prepared for that judgment. We don't have the capacity to handle that judgment, but Jesus took it upon himself. And maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've never come to a place where you've acknowledged Christ, acknowledged that he is the Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Maybe you did this a long time ago, but you walked away from God. Maybe this is your first time back in church or or you're watching online. I want to give you a chance to respond. In a moment, we're going to stand, we're going to worship, and I'm going to pray for everyone because I know God was convicting people in that sermon. We're going to handle that in just a minute, but before we do, I got to give you a chance to respond to Jesus right now. Could we all just bow our heads, close our eyes? If you're online, you can do the same thing. God sees wherever you're at. And if you're saying, James, that's me, I'm that first person, I've never done this before. Or you're saying, James, I'm that second person, I did this a long time ago, but I walked away from Jesus. When I count to three, I'd love you to lift your hand nice and high, because I want to pray for you right where you sit, because I believe God wants to encounter you in your seat today. So if that's you on the count of three, you lift your hands. One, two, three, right now, all over this room. Thank you. Hands in the back, hands on the side, hands here in the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful Lord. If you're online, you can lift your hand because God sees. That's what matters. If you lifted your hand, this is what I'd love you to do. I'd love you to put your hand on your heart. And we're going to pray a a short prayer. In the Bible, in the book of Romans, the apostle Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So I want us all together to pray a prayer that reflects that verse. But for those people that lifted your hand, I really want you to mean these words with all your heart. And I believe that Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, will come and begin to live inside of you in this moment. So come on, say it with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, come to you right now. And I ask you to forgive my sin. I believe that you're the son of God, that you died on the cross, but you defeated death and you rose victorious. Right now I ask, please come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Make me a new creation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Can we give God praise for every hand that was just lifted? If you prayed that prayer in the building, one of our team would have seen you uh, lift your hands, and at the end of the service, they're just going to come and say hi to you. We'd love to talk to you about that decision that you made, help you take the next step in that journey, in the sanctification journey of becoming more like Jesus. If you made that decision online, or you're listening to us, please let us know. There will be a contact link in the description box of whatever platform you're watching or listening on in Jesus' name. Hey, for all of us, why don't we stand? I, uh, I was really convicted as I was writing this sermon. I am, in, in every sermon that I preach, I always make sure that I hold the mirror up to myself before I would ever have the guts to hold the mirror up to anybody in our church. And even as I was preparing and thinking and praying over this sermon, God just began to convict me just of different areas. And I know God's probably convicted you guys of certain areas. And so this is what I want us to do. We're not gonna do a big worship and big tears and everything like that, but I actually just wanna really calmly pray for different groups of people 
that are here. And, uh, and I'm just gonna ask everyone just to shut their eyes just for a moment. And as I pray for the different groups of people, I'd love you just to lift your hands to heaven. And I just wanna pray because I think there's something powerful about you responding in the moment. There's something powerful. It's almost like, hey, the mirror's been held up to you today. Are you gonna ignore it? Or are you gonna say, God, that's me. Would you come and help me? Would you forgive me? Would you heal me? Would you help me? Would you restore? Whatever it is. And so I just want to pray for different groups of people today. Is that all right? Is that all right? Cool. This is the first group of people I want to pray for is people that you have run away from good, godly judgment, that you have wanted to avoid accountability, that you've avoided people speaking into your life because you know you, you maybe didn't want to deal with it. You maybe, and it might have been some good reasons. Maybe you just didn't want things to be unearthed and come up because you knew it would be really tough. But even in this service, you know, God's just been really convicting your heart saying, hey, the time is now. Bring good godly accountability into your life. Let people speak into your life. Maybe you're here and you've carried hurt and pain from other people in the past that have done it the wrong way or been too legalistic or been too harsh on it and it's just made you go oh, I don't want to deal with that again today I believe that God is calling you today to a new heart a soft heart today if that's you whatever it is can you lift your hands to heaven all over this place I want to pray for you. wonderful there's a lot of hands going up in case you got your eyes closed and you're wondering a ton of hands are lifted right now Lord I pray for every person here that God maybe has been avoiding that godly judgment, avoiding the accountability. Lord, I pray that if it's pride that has been stopping us, pride been getting in the way, our feelings being hurt, not even wanting to really address those brokenness issues in our heart, I pray that you would forgive us of that pride right now. Come on, if you know that's an issue in you, I just want you to say, God, would you please forgive me of my pride right now? Lord, forgive us of our pride that has stopped us from hearing this godly feedback, this godly counsel and wisdom. For those that have been hurt here in the past because some pastors, some leaders, some fellow brothers or sisters have just said it in the wrong way, have done it in a harsh way, have, have focused more on the speck rather than their own plank and, and there's just a confusion of hypocrisy there. God, I pray, let healing come right now for those that have experienced that in Jesus' name, for those that have been hurt by dysfunctional pastors or dysfunctional Christians that have done it the wrong way, God, I pray let healing come right now. It never should have happened that way. It never should have gone down like that. But God, I pray let healing come in this moment so that they can move on, God, so that they don't have to be attached to the pain of the past anymore. They don't have to be attached by a chain to that person anymore. Break it. Let forgiveness come. Let healing come right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Maybe you're here and you've still got an unrepentant spirit against a former pastor or a former leader from another church. And when I challenged you to go do something inside of you, it was like, ah, you knew it was you. Can I tell you, the devil will do everything he can to stop you from going and speaking because the devil wants division and he wants disunity in the body of Christ. The Spirit wants to bring unity to you. And so maybe you're here, everyone just close your eyes. Maybe you're here and you're like, oh, that was me. I know it, I know it, oh, I feel it now, I feel it, I know that was me. And it might be a struggle for you. I, I would expect it would be, but I wanna pray for you. If that's you, can you lift your hands to heaven right now? If you know you gotta have some conversations this week and the next month, wherever it is, then maybe you need to go and humble yourself with a former pastor or leader God you see every hand lifted Lord I thank you for the humility I thank you for the wrestle even that's happening right now the wrestle of oh, I know I need to do this but it hurts it's hard God I pray that you would give them boldness right now in Jesus name boldness to have the conversations they need to have God let humility lead the way let humility come and draw them into these conversations. 
Let apologies happen with a humble heart, Lord Jesus, to make a way. I pray for unity in the body of Christ. I pray that we would be able to work out issues with old pastors or with old leaders, God, that we would be able to honor them for the good things that they have done in our lives, that you would give us even the eyes of grace to see maybe their dysfunctions or maybe shortcomings that they have, but to understand why. Give us that grace, God, I pray. Let that just come on every person in our church now, in Jesus' name. Lord, for everyone, come on, why don't we all lift our hands? For everyone here, God, I pray that we would be a church that God doesn't judge with the wrong heart or the wrong spirit, but God, we would be a church that looks at the planks in our own eyes, but still loves our brothers and sisters enough to go after the speck in their eye. Give us the humility, give us the right tone, Lord God, give us the accountability in order to learn how to do it correctly. God, I pray for a church full of people with thick skin and soft hearts. Thick skin and soft hearts, God, to receive from you in Jesus' name. Come on, just as we end this service, I want us to give our attention, our affection, our admiration, our love to Jesus today. Come on, let's sing together. Worthy is your name. Come on, let's worship Him together. Lord God, that this word, Lord God, is a seed, Lord God, that we will take care, Lord God, take care of, Lord God, to grow, Lord God, that we would never, ever, Lord God, become over-familiar with God. So I pray, Father, the things that we need to do, Holy Spirit, help us, strengthen us, give us peace, give us a strength, God, and give us even the wisdom, Lord God, to know what to do and what to say. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. One last time, can we honor our senior pastor for that wonderful work? Thank you so much. You may now take your seats. Give me two minutes. If you get one of those bags, thank you so much for coming along for the very first time here at Favor Church. We want to talk to you after the service. You can go to our Get Connected Neon sign. There are a lot of like friendly and good-looking people that want to connect with you. I have four um, announcements to tell you. College Fund Day, if you're a college student, undergrad, or you have a, you have a college student na pinapaaral mo, or you have, uh, you know someone, you can invite them on Tuesday, April 9, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. at our favorite studio, Shangri-La Plaza. 
You can get all the email, uh, sorry, the sign up links at favor.church slash Manila News. And all the season people here in the house, if you are 50 and above, we want to invite you to our community gathering. Pastor James is going to be there to answer, answer all season related questions. That's going to be happening April 12th. Last day to sign up today, so better not miss that out. And again, Freedom Encounter. So if you want to be free, you, you want to be free with all of your brokenness and all of your past traumas, you can join us at our Freedom Encounter happening April 13. And Favor Conference, we are three weeks away. Can you believe that? So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, we have just a few limited slots, um, I think. So you can... Um, you can I think you got in one of those cards so you can email and register for conference. I think it's not early bird is over, right? Okay, it's over. So it's now 800 pesos for um, registration. So awesome. Can I invite you again to stand up on your feet? Who here wants a week of favor and blessing? Come on, stand up on your feet. Come on, can you lift up your hands to heaven? I'm gonna call on AC the president of our SSA <laughs> to pray for us. AC, come on, can you pray for us? Lord, thank you for this day, God. Thank you, God, for the word that you've planted in our hearts, Father. And I pray that as we go out these doors, God, that we would have the courage, God, to move, God, to move in what you, however you've spoken us today, God. And we pray, Father, God, for every household represented here in this place, every business, every student, God, every university represented, God, I pray that you would pour out blessings and favor throughout all the week, Father. And I pray, God, that we would encounter you and feel your presence wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Take somebody out for lunch and have a good day, guys. See you next Sunday. <laughs>